right, hello everyone. We will get started in just another minute. I'm gonna see if more people are jumping on, but welcome. All right, hello everyone. I'm just gonna give it another minute or so just to see if more people wanna join and then we'll get started. Thank you so much. Um, if you wanna introduce yourself in the chat, feel free. Um, if you have any questions throughout the presentation, you can put it in the Q&A um, window. All right, we're going to get started um, and more people may join us, but hello, thank you everyone for joining us today for this webinar on the power of effective storytelling. This is a public webinar that is being recorded, so if you have any questions, once again, you can feel free to use either the chat um, box or the Q&A box in the webinar um, Zoom panel. And going to get started. So today's presentation, we're going to be talking about why stories are such a powerful form of communication, how we can build momentum, awareness around your cause, your organization, the work you're doing, how it can generate interest in volunteers, supporters, donors, mentees, mentors, etc. We'll talk about some tips for capturing attention in such a busy landscape of social media and other competing narratives. We'll talk about bringing your stories to life and how you tell them and the considerations for ethical storytelling. We're gonna examine Marshall Gantz's um, framework for public narrative, which is all about how we can compel others to join forces with us and take action. And we'll talk about sharing stories, different mediums, platforms, um, tools and techniques. And then I'll leave you today with an exercise to start to develop your own story and public narrative and an opportunity to even elevate it and your work um, in the next month or so. So we have a lot to cover in this webinar. So here we go. First, before we jump into the storytelling content, I did wanna share just a bit about Mentor New York in case this you are new to us as an organization. We are the New York statewide affiliate of Mentor, which is a national organization working to drive equity and ensure that every young person has intentional and impactful relationships with adults wherever they live, learn, work, and play. So we do this by delivering training such as these for capacity building. We provide consultation and support services, and we convene partners across the state to scale solutions. And we serve as a resource, an advocate, a megaphone for the mentoring movement. So if you have any more questions about that, um, please feel free to visit our website, mentoringnewyork.org, uh, mentoringnewyork.org. And also you can always um, contact us to schedule some time to talk about some of those consultation or technical assistance supports that we can provide. 
So my name is Joey Gollum. I am the Associate Director of Partnership Development and Engagement with Mentor New York. I have been with the organization now just shy of a year. Next month is my one year anniversary. Um, and my work at the organization is really to help drive our network of program partners and deliver our services and help to support the movement and advance the movement by infusing mentoring into a number of different programs and opportunities across the state. I come from a arts education background and I have um, a lot of experience in working with nonprofits in the primarily in the education sector, partnering with um, New York City public schools and schools across the state uh, to deliver content that creates um, safe and inclusive learning environments for students where they can thrive. So before we jump into the storytelling content, I want to launch this quick poll to see um, where our group is at at the moment. Let me see if I can get the poll to launch. Okay, so um, I want to just hear how do you feel about your short storytelling skills at the moment? Um, your options are, eh, I'm at a loss for words. Okay, there's a beginning, middle, and end, right? <laughs> Doing good, I can keep my friends entertained. And awesome, Hollywood should be calling. So it's always great to um, see where people are coming into these webinars. It's going to take a moment. Right. Okay, cool. Thanks for participating in that. I can just share the results. You can see we have a um, nobody really extremely confident about their storytelling skills, which I think is great, you know, to come into a webinar like this, but a lot of people sort of in that middle, I know what I'm doing, or I feel pretty confident with it, but I'm looking to kind of strengthen some skills and, and some tips and ideas during this session. So that's great. Okay, so I want to start with just this uh, Steve Jobs quote, the most powerful person in the world is the storyteller. The storyteller sets the vision, values, and agenda for an entire generation that is to come. So I think this is great to start with just to talk about and think about how important and how um, how influential stories can be in compelling people to really advance something, to uh, champion something, to be supporters of something. So why stories? Why are stories so important? Well, I found this really interesting. Researchers actually believe that we're evolutionarily hardwired to respond to stories. This is kind of cool. When we were evolving as a species, you know, some humans would go out and they would experience something. Maybe it was something that was really dangerous, or maybe they found something that was um, life life saving or exciting and thrilling. And they would come back and share stories. And so through that experience of share of storytelling, we're able to learn, problem solve, experience things without actually putting ourselves through harm's ways. Um, without actually living through that experience firsthand. So you can think about how awesome that is to think about how fundamental stories are to who we are as people. The second reason stories are so powerful is they're sticky. <laughs> Um, so that we, re we remember them. According to a London Business School study, retention rates vary based on how we communicate different information, of course, and storytelling increased retention by as much as 70%. So it, stories have that power to really stick with us so that we can remember things. And a well-told told story is fundamentally memorable because it makes us feel something. So Maya Angelou, of course, famously said, I've learned that people will forget what you said, people will forget what you did, but people will never forget how you made them feel. So really thinking about how we can have stories make us feel something so that they won't forget it, so that it sticks with them and it's something that they can relate to. They start to create connection and empathy and it triggers emotion. 
And then stories lastly can move us to action, whether it's to vote a certain way, whether it's to become a brand loyalist or to donate your money or time. Stories with a strong emotional engagement, a clear rationale and a sense of urgency can drive us to take desired actions. So that's really why stories are so powerful. So I want to start by just sort of framing uh, what we all may be very aware of as some of the challenges in this um, in this storytelling space. And a lot of it really comes down to capturing attention. I think we can all relate to this. In the last handful of years, you know, social media has really become this prominent platform for sharing our stories um, or just digital medium in general between email newsletters. I'm sure. Um, you know, for better or worse, everyone's inbox was probably saturated with giving Tuesday um, emails yesterday and then, of course, on social media, too. So I think the challenge for organizations is how do we actually stand out in this very noisy landscape? How do we capture attention? How do we keep that attention? And how do we translate that attention into donations, volunteers, supporters, etc.? And so today I want to talk about how storytelling can be a strategy for doing that. Um, so one of the challenges I think organizations come up against when, when um, embarking on storytelling is that we get stuck in a certain storytelling box. We really feel like we have to tell stories a certain way for them to be, you know, great stories. And maybe you can think of some examples of uh, the mindset you have to think about storytelling. Maybe you feel like you have to tell really happy stories or really sad stories. Maybe you feel you have to tell really gut-wrenching or heartbreaking stories. And it can be challenging when we get stuck in this mindset that stories have to be told a certain way to be effective, especially when we think about compelling donors or, or funders. And, um, and then, of course, we're challenged, you know, by all of the competing noises. So how do we really stand out when so many people and so many organizations are telling their story? And so I think one of the, um, the things to think about is that we have to be true to our organization. Um, we have to be authentic to our organization and really think about the strategy and the intention behind why we're telling these stories. One, one strategy that I think a lot of organizations um, approach or the way they approach it is to try to be you know, the loudest megaphone in the space. So maybe the way they think they need to compete is by posting constantly and consistently to kind of stand out. Um, and so what happens is they get caught on this content creation hamster wheel where they're having to create a lot of content and post things all the time, or they're really engaged in this one way communication where they're not really thinking about community building, they're not really encouraging conversation. And that's really an important thing to think about when being strategic about your storytelling. So if that's what you think your organization is doing right now, you know, we're gonna put that strategy aside. Um, one of the other attempts that a lot of times organizations make is the copycat cat methodology. They might see another organization doing something successfully, and so they say, oh, you know, maybe if I can copy their style, copy their approach, um, then I'll have success as well. So sometimes what that looks like is, you know, an organization posted a really uplifting and positive story and delightful, upbeat, and you might think, okay, that's what I should do too. Um, but there's so many other variables and factors to really what can make a, a story stick for an organization. So again, really leading with authenticity can be a stronger approach than sort of just lifting what another organization is doing. And then the last challenge, that I listed here is really this mindset. I really want to underscore that, you know, telling stories shouldn't just be this uh, make more work project. A lot of organizations, again, feel like we should be telling stories and we need to be telling stories. So this is something we need to be investing our capacity into and we just need to be um, just creating, creating, creating. But if you're just telling stories for the sake of telling stories, then you should put a pause in that because it's just never worth it just to tell stories for the sake of it. You really want to think about how you can have that strategy and purpose behind the stories that you're telling to benefit your organization. So hopefully um, some of these further slides will help you to think about some of those approaches in a more intentional way. So 
the first one of really thinking about how to embrace authenticity. You know, what makes us different? What makes us worth paying attention to in this noisy world that we're in? So these are some questions that I think are helpful to start to explore really what makes your organization you, you know, your organization special. So these are the questions. What makes you you, really thinking from your organization? How do you do what you do differently? So really thinking about, you know, especially for positioning, what, what stands you out from maybe if you're a mentoring organization or your community-based organization, um, you know, how do you approach your work differently? What do you and your audience have in common? This is really great to think about. There was, um, there was a study that, that uh, showed that people really donate. It was from the University of Indiana. They released, um, their School of Philanthropy released this report that cited that increasingly values, value aligned giving what was, was, what was driving donors. You know, So donors are giving because it reflects what their values are, what they believe in, what they want to support. Um, and so if you can really identify what values perhaps you and your audience have in common, then you can start to hone in on those and it might drive more support. Um, and then lastly, again, thinking about values, what values or worldviews inform your organization's approach? And the more that you can kind of do that soul searching work of digging down and identifying those really interesting and essential components of what makes your organization who it is and how it does the work, um, the more compelling and interesting your organization is going to be um, and stand out. And so then the three ways, the three components that you really want to include in your stories are thinking, feeling, and doing. So these might seem obvious, but thinking, you know, stories fundamentally are um, expressing some kind of information. They're sharing some kind of information, facts, details, who, what, when, where, why, and how, right? So that's the thinking level. We just need to be able to communicate um, information, right? And then the feeling level, this is the emotional level. And we're going to go a little bit deeper into this in the next slide. But this is really critical, again, in considering what emotion are we eliciting, soliciting, you know, with this, um, with this story? What are we asking our um, constituents to feel when they hear the story? Because what kind of emotional response do we want them to have from it? And then lastly, and this is perhaps the piece that comes more naturally to organizations that might be easier to um, consider is the doing. What's the, what's the call to action? What's the ask? You know, what do you want your um, audience to do after they hear this story? And so, you know, as a reflection question, I, I ask you to consider, you know, what are you doing well right now when you consider all of these different tips? Are you really leaning into the thinking, feeling, doing? Um, have you really embraced your authenticity as an organization? And then the last tip here as you're considering that is really that there's this broad range of emotions on the spectrum. And I mentioned before that you might get stuck in this storytelling box of thinking, we need to tell really happy stories, or we need to tell really gut-wrenching stories. But um, I think it's really important to consider what feelings do your audience have about your work that you might be able to tap into, and what values drive certain feelings from our audience that are going to help to um, compel our, our supporters to get involved. And so I think that this next slide is helpful. Um, we're going to talk about the feelings bit a bit more here. This is a tool that is uh, the Plutchix, I think that's how I pronounce it, Plutchix Wheel of Emotion. It's out of the psychology world. But I think it's a useful tool for us here um, when we think about nonprofit storytelling. So in this wheel, he identified eight core emotions, which are in the inner circle here, and you can see. And then as the petals go out from that inner circle, there's basically a different intensity of that feeling. And then as they combine with one another, um, you develop other emotions and other experiences, right? So what I think is great about this chart is that it really reminds us that there's this wide spectrum of feelings that people can have about our work and about the things we're doing, about the issues we work in in the world. 
And so there's value in having a more nuanced understanding of what those emotions are and being able to really tap into those things a bit more. So I have an example that's not um, directly about mentoring, but I think it's a really uh, strong example for this, this consideration around the emotions. You know, when I think about climate change activism, a lot of times when I hear um, advocates talk about climate change, it might come from a place of anger, you know, frustration that not more action is being taken place, that we've um, got into this place with climate change um, and feeling frustrated and that urgency and that, that comes out of anger. But interestingly, also with climate change, you know, you really have this sadness or this grief or this fear um, that they, this is such a, a, lar a huge issue that's going to be very hard to turn around, you know, immediately to really make the changes that need to happen. So I think that's a great example to think about, again, how you can have these dual emotions um, and that when you are able to tell stories that you really can tap into a wide range of emotions, it gives you a broader spectrum of the kind of stories that you can be telling and the kind of emotions that you can be touching upon that your audience might be experiencing. So just a few more tips. There is, seems to be a myth in uh, storytelling in our space that we constantly have to be creating new stories to share with our audience that, you know, once we've told a story, um, people are going to remember it. And so we can't tell it again. And it's just going to be redundant content. But I think that that is, uh, that's a bad assumption to make at this point. I mean, if you even think earlier today, this morning, maybe right before this webinar, if you were scrolling through social media, try to think if there's like, uh, any posts or stories that you scrolled past that you can really remember. Maybe you can, maybe it's less than a handful that you can really, you know, recall. And so I think that because what we talked about being so saturated with content, it's fair to say that a lot of our content that we're sharing is, is not going to be fully, you know, consumed by our audience. And so we can get more mileage from our stories. And I'm not necessarily suggesting just to you know, be reposting the same picture with the same caption over and over again. But we can think about how to um, leverage their stories to get in front of different audiences. We can be strategic about the way we might shift or tell our story in a different way to really um, fulfill a different purpose in our, in our strategy. And so again, you don't have to get overwhelmed by kind of just creating content and putting it out there mindlessly. Again, you can think strategically about how to leverage some of those stories to fill different needs for your organization. I'm gonna come back to the slide, but I did wanna show an example of this. America's Promise is really an amazing organization um, model for storytelling, and particularly because they do such a great job of um, authentically telling uh, elevating youth voice in their storytelling. Um, if you're not familiar with America's Promise, they're one of the largest uh, nationwide partnerships of their kind, and they bring together hundreds of national nonprofits, businesses, communities, educators, and citizens uh, behind the idea of making the promise of America accessible to all young people. So this is, you know, having caring adults in their life, safe places, um, a healthy start, effective education, and opportunities to help others. And so they have a campaign, the hashtag grad nation, uh, where they're, you know, looking to increase graduation rates. And so I know it might be hard to read all of this text, but just to show these are three different ways that they utilize they told the story of this campaign. Uh, the one way was through a survey where they were really able to uh, show how um, high schoolers were experiencing school and how they felt that it best prepared them for life after graduation and where some of those gaps might be. Um, and then to the far right, they were actually to have, have a press release specifically on some of the tactics that they're taking as an organization to uh, ensure graduation rates, even with some of the um, challenges of COVID-19. And then in the middle, they took this, you know, human approach to really highlight a quote or a testimonial from one young person who, uh, you know, they empowered to share their story to talk about what, uh, what some of the challenges might be around graduating from high school or really feeling that high school was 
responding in a relevant way to the needs that they had. So I, again, I just think that's a great example of how you can leverage one campaign, one story, one story, one hashtag, you know, in a number of different ways that are going to reach audiences in different ways. And so coming back to some of the, the tips here, um, one of the, the things that I think is always really promising for organizations that get stories to stick is when they connect to a bigger picture. So if you can tap in, if you can connect your story to something that's happening in the news right now, something that's happening in pop culture, if your audience is already thinking about it, if it's already something that is, is uh, drawing their attention, then that's only going to help to bring more attention to the story that you have to tell to. Um, the second advice here is to form opinions. And these, uh, this sometimes might be challenging for organizations. You might be uh, shy to form opinions because you're afraid it might be polarizing and you might lose some of your audience. But I think particularly in this time, it's really important that we, we uh, form opinions, that it helps to inform the narrative we're telling and makes a statement about our values as an organization and as an institution. And so you can really think about, you know, I'm not suggesting to form controversial opinions, but, you know, take a stand about having a certain value in your work or take a stand on a certain um, issue can help to really, again, align with your audience and, and share those values. And with that in mind, creating opportunities to listen to your audience more, um, really learning what your audience cares about, how they're understanding your, the story you're telling and the work and the way that they can be engaged with it. And then this last tip, I think, you know, a lot of us might have perfectionist tendencies. And so the idea of putting stories out is really overwhelming because we wanna make sure that it's just right. And I think with any of this work, again, we don't wanna be just churning out content for the sake of it, but a lot of it is just um, embrace imperfection. You want to be strategic, intentional with what you're telling, but then learn from it. You know, know that it's, that it's a process of telling and telling and telling and learning and receiving feedback um, so that your stories can only get stronger from here. Okay. So story structure, how do we bring these stories to life? How do we talk about these stories? So I'm sure we're all familiar with the story arc. You probably saw it in some high school English class. It's withstood the test of time and for good reason. It's something we're all familiar with. And so I think it's important to embrace the story arc and the story structure because of that familiarity and the way it's gonna resonate with your audience. So you're gonna find a relatable protagonist, someone, who your audience can understand and root for, someone who people are going to want to see succeed by the end of the story. You set a clear goal with an understandable motive for your uh, protagonist. You establish obstacles that create risk and struggle. And then you end with some kind of resolution. And this is where the nonprofit, where your organization has the opportunity to connect your mission to the protagonist's story and transformation. And then the, so that's the, the traditional story structure. On the right is uh, in 2013, so a little while back now, there was a columnist, David Lieber, who was from the Dallas Morning News, and he had sort of a humorous TED talk um, with some insights about the power of storytelling to change the world. And he reduced it down to what he called the magic D-shaped storytelling formula. And so this form for storytelling formula might be more helpful in social media when you need to develop an entire storyline in a brief minute or two. Um, but essentially with here, you're just introducing the character and making people care about them, bringing the story to its lowest point, and then turning it around and finishing with a happy ending, tying up those loose ends. Um, and so you know, again, I think that thinking about that, it's very obvious to, for us to say, oh, stories have a beginning, middle and end. But I think a lot of times, especially with, with like social media and these different platforms we're embracing, we sort of forget that, you know, we just wanna, we might get too stuck in trying to convey a certain emotion or just telling what the win might be. But I think really thinking about that story structure will help to create that, that, that foundation that will really guide your audience through that story journey. 
But I also want to make sure that we touch upon ethical storytelling, because when we talk about some of those dips or those challenges or roadblocks in our protagonist story, we have to be, you know, take additional care with really thinking about how we're framing our story and communicating it to the public. You know, we when we're talking about um, the impact that we're having, a lot of times we can focus too much on like portraying certain circumstances for our target group that we're um, impacting and the plight you know of them so in publishing our stories we have to be extra sensitive because these are perhaps widely distributed and they might have a huge impact on the individual's lives that we're you know telling the stories of um, you may be familiar with the term uh, or phrase poverty porn, and this really came into uh, use in the 1980s to describe how nonprofits were using graphic images of starving, ill, or poor people, and, and most often children, to elicit donations. But in the process, they were really you know, stripping these subjects of their dignity and exploiting their, um, exploiting their dire circumstances. So we want to be careful not to do that. So here's some tips for thinking about considerations for ethical storytelling. So the first is to get input from the people whose stories you are sharing. And if you, especially, you know, if you're a mentoring program, if you're working with young people, really, you know, authentic way to engage them to elevate their voice is to be transparent with them about what this process looks like. And so you can really be very transparent about the way that you want to, um, elevate their stories that might get some more support. Um, and then, of course, there's the, the more logistical parts of always remembering consent and identification. You're going to ask your constituents if they're comfortable with you sharing their personal story, if they're comfortable being named. Um, we want to we want to you know shy away from over dramatization or stereotyping or simplifying of the story. So even if we think it's going to be emotionally persuasive to really lean into one aspect of the story, we don't want to morph it into something that it's not. We want to be really clear with the constituent about how we're using their story and for how long. So that comes back to some of that consent. You might actually think about what policies or systems you have in place so that they know how you're using those stories in that consent form and, and how long it will be shared for. And if you're having, uh, if there's sort of a gray area where you're a little bit unclear as to what, you know, might be sensitive or not, um, you can seek the advice of other leaders in the field. You can always come to Mentor New York if you have some questions about that um, and the ethics behind what you're sharing. We'd be happy to lend another eye to that situation. And then sometimes ultimately it's just better not to share, you know, and you can consider that if you're really feeling um, questionable about the content or you don't have um, consensus from, you know, from the, the constituents who it's about, you to, then it's better not to share ultimately. So those are some things to think about with ethical storytelling. And the other approach that I want to highlight here in this space is it's the idea of assets-based language versus deficit-focused, and perhaps you're familiar with this already. But when we think about appreciative inquiry, when we're really digging into the story that we want to tell and what we want to elevate, um, the assets-based approach is to really think about, look at what we've got, and the deficit focus is really look at what we're missing. And I think particularly in the mentoring field, there's a history of um, using a deficit focused approach to get people behind mentoring young people because we say you know these young people um, come from poverty or violence or they don't have people in their lives who are um, you know there for them to provide this opportunity and instead we can really shift that narrative to be talking more about the passions the interests the um, the strength in culture and identity that these young people have their talents and how the you know systems of the world have been built to not give them the opportunities that um, that they deserve and that they, you know so that we want to create more of those opportunities and pathways through mentoring, but really we're using asset based language to talk about the individuals and how we can highlight and elevate and, and shine, um, have these young people shine. Um, and the same approach with thinking about the way we talk about our mentors. Um, so that's just something to consider when you're also thinking about the ethical approach to storytelling. 
So moving on from that, I think that it can be helpful to think about some categories of uh, storytelling that your nonprofit can employ. Um, so it just gives you an idea of maybe things you weren't thinking about, but um, stories highlighting how your organization was founded, you know, on what principles or what was the catalyst for its uh, founding, focusing on its your current work and purpose of the organization, the mission. You can share stories about impact, um, you know, obviously organizations do this a lot, but really showing uh, the influence that they have on the people that they serve using data and metrics to inform those stories. You can, of course, as we were just talking about, tell stories about people, individuals, have that human element come in. So really highlighting your mentors, mentees, donors, clients, individuals, volunteers, whoever it may be. Um, stories about strength, how maybe you overcame a challenge or how you've been able to uh, really further your mission through um, setbacks or or just the strength that the strengths that you have as an organization. And again, coming back to that idea of your authentic identity as an organization, what really makes you you focusing on the strengths that you bring to the to the field and the sector. And then the last category here is really describing the future. What do you envision for your organization? What do you hope to achieve? How do you hope to um, how do you hope that the the funder or the audience can help to achieve that mission? Okay. So now diving into public narrative. So um, I wanted to highlight Marshall Gans, if you haven't heard of him before. He is famously attributed uh, with his fame framework being used in Obama's uh, 2004 presidential, you know, grassroots campaign, which is really awesome. He, you know, through, I just gave a little bit of context for his, uh, his career, his, his credentials, because I think that it's, it's important and it sort of highlights, you know, where this work is coming from. You know, through the 1930s through 60s, he was a community organizer and really helped with the farm workers in California. In the 80s, he, um, he used, he developed uh, voter mobilization strategies with grassroots groups, which again, uh, informed some of the work later in the framework and for Obama's campaign. He continued his education, which is always a really wonderful thing in the 1990s to get his uh, BA, MPA, and PhD. And then today he's a senior lecturer at the public policy at Harvard Kennedy School, and he teaches a lot about um, public narrative and this framework that he developed. So this is what the framework looks like. Public narrative is not a form of self-expression is an exercise of leadership by motivating others to join you in action on behalf of a shared purpose. So it's a sc scaffolding of leadership, narrative, and organizing to achieve shared purpose. And I think this is helpful in this storytelling um, storytelling webinar because we're thinking about, I think a lot of times we focus on how can we tell the story of like our programs, our people, our work. But I think when we start to think about also us as leaders and elevating um, some of our staff or their perspective or the mentors focus on how they're contributing to your larger mission, it's helpful to have this framework of really thinking about the story of self, the story of us and the story of now. So the story of self tells us, you know, why we've been called to serve. We have our own individual stories to tell. We've all had differing life experiences which have shaped our core values and beliefs. And so the power of the story of self is to reveal something about yourself and your values, not your deepest, darkest secrets, but the key um, shaping moments in your life. So consider when you first started to care about the work that you're doing now and, and you know, why you chose to work in the field you're doing now. Why is it important to you and why do you feel like you have to do something about it? And then the story of us communicates why your community in particular is called to act, why you as a group have the capacity to lead. Um, just as in your story of self, the key is to focus on telling a story about a specific people and specific moments that have shaped your organizing community and then invite others to join the community. So telling a story of us requires learning how to put into narrative from the experiences that the us in, your, in the community you share with 
um, each other, and then motivating those people to take action with you based on the values that you share. And then lastly, the story of now communicates this urgent challenge that we are called upon to face right now. This, is, this story includes like a description of the path to take um, to achieve goals relative to the mission. So um, the, this story of us also invites your listeners to make a specific actionable commitment to now help build your campaign. So the story of now is an urgent call to action that you can use to ask for commitments. Um, but it becomes much more than the ask. It's a choice about whether somebody is going to stay on the sidelines or dive into the campaign. It's a choice about whether they'll take advantage of this historic opportunity or let history pass them by. You know, in the spirit of Hamilton, I am not throwing away my shot. So you want to drive that passion um, for them to be involved and get engaged. So I want to uh, play this short four minute video. And <clears throat> excuse me, as you watch, I invite you to write down the key phrases that seem to fit these categories in her story of the self, the us, and the now. So hopefully you'll be able to hear it. I think I'm sharing my sound. All right, and um, here we go. Mm -hmm. I'm an emergency medicine resident. In my work, I see that time and health are our most precious assets, and we often don't appreciate them until they're depleted. I believe that the key to a healthier society is also a more just and equal society. And my interest in health and social justice has taken me from my parents' home in Calgary to the remote Himalayan Spitty Valley, to rural Nicaragua, to Vancouver's downtown east side, to England, and most recently, Montreal. But I stepped outside my clinical training this year because I realized that clinical care, while important, is maybe 20% of what contributes to my patient's health. The other 80% is the health ecosystem. It's the broader social and cultural determinants of health. And I want to share a story that illustrated that for me. I want you to imagine that it's midnight in the emergency room. Joe is your next patient. Everyone knows him because it's his 29th visit this year and it's only March. What brings you in today, my friend? Hit and run, doc. Need a few stitches. His voice is drawled and the smell of alcohol hangs on his breath. What have you been drinking this time? Oh, the good stuff. None of that Listerine today, Doc. I got 20 bucks from that last driver. Joe earns his living by jumping in front of vehicles outside the emergency room and then offering not to call the police for a price. He always has a smile and a story. So you suture him up, you give him a sandwich, and discharge him. Now imagine your next night shift. The paramedics drive in, sirens blazing, with an unrecognizable trauma victim. Middle-aged middle man with hemorrhagic shock, traumatic brain injury, flail chest. The list of injuries continues. What was the mechanism? Hit and run, dragged by a truck for two miles. Do we have an ID? It's Joe. He died that night in our trauma bay. I've been trained for trauma and resuscitation. But stories like Joe's have made me realize that in spite of my training, I'm often ill-equipped to impact my patient's health. Each time we saw Joe, we treated him and then discharged him to the same environment that would inevitably lead to his returning. It's why his story haunts me. Because no matter how skilled I am as a clinician, I can't suture poverty, prescribe a home, cast a broken school system, or treat the intergenerational trauma that manifests itself in our emergency room. I work in a system where the ingredients for health are inaccessible for many of our neighbors. And I truly believe that good health is one of the most precious gifts that we have in life. 
And I think we can all help address the inequalities that contribute to poor health in our own ecosystems, regardless of our field. So how do we do it? We need a new paradigm. We need to apply a health lens in all of our decision making to ask, how does this impact the health of my family, my neighbors, and my community? In the policy world, we can't just think in terms of economic growth and GDP anymore. All policies impact health, and it's the one thing money can never buy or replace. Okay, so, you know, wonderful storyteller there. And really, um, you know, Jazz Preet uses this challenge, this choice, this, um, you know, this outcome, this desire for how we can be thinking about health in, you know, all of our various fields. Um, and so, you know, for Gans, the the plot of the character really starts with this unexpected challenge. And she really, in her narrative, really presented that challenge. You know, she's in pursuit, pursuit of her purpose. Um, she's faced with an urgent need to pay attention of how to respond to a certain challenge and, and choice. And then she sort of comes to this realization, um, you know, we have a moral there about how we can have a broader impact on, um, on what you know is her vision for how we can we can address these issues. And so, of course, also we're experiencing this emotional journey with her through the struggle that she um, expresses. And so it's really great to sort of think about uh, you know, how we can tell our public narrative with that, with this choice, with this challenge, with the outcome that we want to see. Now, of course, I think one of the things, again, just to highlight that, uh, you know, one of the challenges with this or limitations of this framework is that it does sort of, um, you know, promote a male dominant, dominant culture in terms of what like success and outcomes should look like. So I just remind you back to those ethical storytelling and assets based approach where we can think about that we can shift that paradigm to really think about how we're talking about what success and outcomes look like and, and not to just fall back on some of those more traditional narratives around that. So we're going to um, come back to Gans's uh, framework in a bit, but before we do, um, I wanted to take a moment just to talk about some storytelling tools. And some of these might be really obvious to you and some might, you know, hopefully be new uh, things to think about. So the first, of course, is in infographics. So infographics are a great way to break through the clutter because they can package your information in a way that people can easily scan and then decide if they're, you know, hungry for more. Um, and so in fact, some research has shown that articles featuring infographics receive about 72% more views than text only articles. So that's really you know, important to think about. And if you're not familiar, I think it's been around long enough now that most people are familiar with it, but canva.com um, is really a great resource if you don't have the capacity to be um, creating infographics. It's a great, like easily accessible uh, graphics design tool that you can use that might help to translate some of your data into um, a, a visually pleasing uh, format. The next, of course, is video. So video is the most consumed content on the web with online videos anticipated to make up more than 82% of all consumer traffic, um, internet traffic. So, you know, I think that we have to embrace where we're at now uh, with social media. And if you can capture more things by video, um, even making using some, uh, you know, stock image imagery that you might have with text and, and um, music behind it, you can create something that can be more compelling than just, uh, you know, simple narrative and images. This next one I think is interesting, a little bit outside of the box of in terms of storytelling, but really tools to help with your storytelling is to think about a donor survey um, or an audience survey. This is just a great vehicle for constituents to feel like their voices are heard. Um, and it also offers your organization invaluable information about how you're being perceived by the audience that you're trying to you know, get attention from. So you can, uh, you know, if you're interested in learning if you are, um, you know, for lack of a better phrase, like customer service is good, the way that you're interacting with other people, if your audience really shares your beliefs, if they're aware of the consequences of, you know, the, the gap in the work that you're trying to serve, 
If you feel like you really want to understand how connected they are to your cause, do they trust you as an organization to do the work well? Um, you know, are they learning? Are they, are you taking them on a journey through engagement with your organization? All of these things you can learn with really um, pointed and intentional questions through a survey that can really inform your storytelling approaches better. I talked about this, I mentioned this briefly before, but empowering your staff and supporters to become storytellers. So again, this might be helpful in thinking about Gantz's public narrative framework, um, but sharing stories regularly with your staff, with your donors and members can encourage them to do the same. So, you know, maybe it's part of your company culture that if you have a staff meeting once a week or once a month, that you start by everyone sharing some kind of story. You know, so this is a great way that you can capture um, stories across your organization and turn your entire organization into a storytelling organization. You know, I think a lot of times in the organizations I've worked with, um, you're probably familiar with that feeling when a development person or, you know, a grant writer is coming to you and they're like, what's the stories? You know, why don't, you know, can you tell me a story about what happened in that program? And it feels like it's all on them to sort of fill that gap. And so if you're in the programming space, you know, thinking about how you can build systems for really um, identifying stories consistently through your program and creating channels to solicit that will really help to have a story bank ultimately when you need to fall back on it. Um, you can crowdsource content. So this is an economical way to obtain, you know, video content or really any um, content. Uh, everyone has, you know, a device now pretty much. So asking people to take a photograph, um, a video, uh, you know, sharing a little bit of information from their smartphone can really encourage that, um, that collaboration and that people are helping to tell their stories and it empowers them also to be thinking about the, the impact that they're having. And then, of course, that human element, you know, when we can put a human face to your cause and show how it impacts people, then people are much more compelled to be part of your mission. You know, we're familiar, this is a pretty old campaign now, but the Humans of New York campaign, which um, started in 2010 by the photographer Brandon Stanton, um, it's a tremendous example of how, like, the power of human faces can, you know, engage people through step storytelling. Um, and so, you know, Standard was able to like cultivate millions of dollars from like over a hundred thousand donors uh, just because he had this this great uh, way of really showing human human um, humans and and their vulnerabilities uh, through this platform. So something to think about. All right. So uh, what I want to share here, and I actually have a um, a worksheet that we're, you know, we're not going to like dive so much into now, but it's something that I wanted to um, present to you all um, as sort of a takeaway for this. So I'm going to plug it into the chat here. So this is a worksheet that, and I just basically put the different sections of the worksheet on this slide, but it's a lot of text for a slide. So if you're able to open the worksheet, you'll be able to see it a little bit better. But basically it's an exercise to walk you through that framework of Gans's framework about thinking about the story of us, the story of self, the story of us and the story of now. So really um, first reflecting on the experiences that you've had um, and who makes you, you, and then what maybe brought you, what, how that connects to the work that you're doing now. Um, so again, and then the story of now, really what the urgency is, what's happening now, and then the story of us, uh, you know, why we should champion, champion around this uh, cause, you know, why this community should help to support this cause, and then the specific call to action. So hopefully that worksheet, if you have time or if you with, you know, can share with your colleagues as well, is a way you can kind of work through different prompts to start to put together what your story, what your public narrative can be. And then you can really piece those, bring those pieces together, refine them, think about them more, and hopefully they'll turn into some kind of great narrative that can really um, talk about the power of the work that you're doing. And there might be pieces that you can leverage to help tell your story in, in different platforms in the next month or so. And one of those opportunities that I want to highlight is that January is annual, the annual mentoring um, 
National Mentoring Month. And so this is a nationwide campaign to really uh, be a celebration of mentoring and the impact that it has. And so um, I'm going to put a link in the chat um, for uh, the for the National Mentoring Month campaign. And through there, you're going to find there's a number of resources um, about the, the Mentoring Month and how we're celebrating it. But also it has a digital engagement toolkit. And that's a great resource if you want to leverage uh, the, the opportunity of the month to tell more stories and bring more attention to the work that you're doing. And so, um, I'm going to put this in the chat, this link, so that you can see more information about National Mentoring Month. But I also invite you, as you're developing these stories, and perhaps it's from the work you want to do on the worksheet about public narrative, perhaps it's other stories that you have, perhaps it's stories from your mentors or mentees, um, the people that you're working with. Uh, we're going to be doing some outreach in the next month or so where there'll actually be a Google form where you can submit those stories um, and then we can we'll share them through National Mentoring Month, but also just throughout the month. Oh, you're unable to see. Oh, I'm sorry. Thank you for letting me know that, Terrence. I'm going to um, reshare the document and the link. Here's the link to National Mentoring Month. You should be able to see that now. And then I'm going to reshare the document. Um, so that you have that, but uh, great. I'm glad that worked now. Okay, so basically anything that you share during National Mentoring Month, if you put one of those hashtags um, for National Mentoring Month, or if you tag us, Mentor New York, we will reshare your content as part of that campaign effort. So that's another great way to sort of elevate your narrative. Um, so hopefully that will be a helpful resource for you and a great uh, tool to, um, to start to leverage your stories. So I hope that this content was helpful today. I'm going to um, share, this is a survey that I hope that, uh, that everyone will um, take quickly. You can use the QR code on your phone um, if you take a picture of, of the screen. Um, if you're not able to access it that way, I will put uh, the link for the survey in the chat. Um, but basically, um, I'm just going to stay on for a little bit now. If people have questions, you can put it in the Q&A or you can put it in the chat. Um, I'm happy to try to answer any questions. And then otherwise, thank you all so much for attending. I hope you'll quickly take the survey um, so that uh, we get some insight into how you, you know, if you felt that this webinar was helpful, um, if there's other webinars that you would like us to do. Um, in the future. So I really hope that you will uh, you will share that information with us through the survey. But otherwise, thank you again so much for coming. I'm gonna put the link to the survey in the chat, just pulling it up now. Oops. All right. Otherwise, um, like I said, I'll stay on a little bit for questions. And if you don't have any questions, really appreciate you coming out and or show it up on the webinar and have a great rest of your day. Thank you. All right. Thank you all so much. I'm going to close the webinar, but um, have a great one. And thanks again for coming.